Welcome back to the Teach for the Heart podcast, where we tackle teaching challenges from a biblical perspective. Why are we here? Because we don't believe that our spiritual walk and teaching profession should exist in two separate domains. Rather, the hope we have in Christ should change how we approach everything, not just at home, but at school as well. So join us as we explore both the spiritual and practical sides of key teaching challenges, integrating them together so we can succeed at teaching, glorify God, and make a lasting difference in our students' hearts and lives. This episode is brought to you in partnership with the Herzog Foundation, and I'm so excited to be joined today by our new podcast manager at Teach for the Heart, Carly Smith, to talk about simple ways to relieve decision fatigue. So Carly, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited. All right. And so today, Carly and I are just going to have a conversation about decision fatigue and what it is and some ways that we can relieve it. Because this is definitely something that whether you've heard this term or not, you're probably experiencing as a teacher. Uh, Carly, do you want to kick us off by sharing some thoughts on what exactly is a decision fatigue and why is it so common for teachers? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually teachers, doctors, and some law enforcement. It's a huge issue for all those kinds of people who deal with people during the day, right? So they have a lot of interactions with many, many different kinds of people and a lot of responsibilities. So in all of that, each of those people you interact with, you're going to make decisions about them, right? And so teachers and anyone who's dealing with this many decisions in a day, gets overwhelmed by that make having to make that many decisions, right? And so the, they coined a term called decision fatigue. And uh, they actually estimate that teachers probably make at least 1,500 decisions a day at work, if not more. Like that's what they could estimate. Um, and there's a, a, a article that I we can put in the chat about how they came to that number and stuff. But it's really, when you think about it, when I first heard the term, I was so relieved um, cause I was teaching high school English at the time and I was so relieved to know that that feeling of like not wanting to decide things when I came home was because of all the decisions that were happening during the day. And so if you think about just like one classroom experience, one period, one block of time, just think about all the decisions you have to make about how to respond to a student, about what you guys should be doing in class, about how to pivot and when something goes sideways, all of those add up really, really fast. Yeah. And I know I totally (laughs) relate to this. When I first heard the term, it's been a while since I first heard the term, but same thing. It was like, wow, yes, this is exactly what I'm feeling. And we'll link to the article if you're kind of interested in more of the research at teachfortheheart.com slash 302. But right. um, I find this with my um, husband all the time. Well, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll say something and I'll just be like, I just don't want to decide that. Like, can I have the same lunch every day? I don't want to pick any extra lunch. Or like, I feel like he said something the other day, like, you probably wish you could just wear the same outfit every day. I'm like, yes, that would be amazing. <laughs> I want yes. this decision to make. Yes. I, I have a friend who texts us because I'm not currently teaching and she will text us the night before school and be like, what should I, what color should I wear tomorrow? And she just picks her outfit based on, we decide what color for her. Uh, And it just, that's something that helps her not have to make that decision. (laughs) So I love that. So if you can relate to this at all, um, teachers that, yeah, yeah, like sometimes it's just so many decisions and it's just hard to make all of them. Um, This is a very real thing and something that it it makes sense when you think about it. So what we want to do today is talk a little bit about well, what do we do? What are some things that we can do to relieve that decision fatigue, to save our, you know, decision making capabilities for things that really matter um, as much as we can, you know, so that we have that creativity and we're not totally worn out when we sit down to lesson plan and actually want to be creative. So let's see, we were talking, um, Carly and I were talking, we're thinking about, you know, what patterns can we use in our classroom that help diminish the number of decisions that we make every day? Because any type of pattern we can introduce um, can help eliminate at least a certain number of decisions. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about here. So Carly, I know you had some ideas of some different patterns that you've used or you've had friends that have had success with. Real quick, I also forgot to have you introduce yourself. Do you want to share a little bit about like what um, grades and subjects you taught? 
Yeah, absolutely. I uh, taught high school English for five years at a small STEM school. So we did things a little differently. So I taught semester courses that were accelerated. But um, And then the last couple of years, I've been doing some consulting and some different kind of teacher training things. And now I'm here doing the podcast. So that's my really brief background. <laughs> But when I was teaching high school English, I did actually, I really struggled with decision fatigue. I already don't like making more decisions than I absolutely have to. Um, so I tried to make things easy for myself. So when you're, you know, making decisions about curriculum and what to teach every day, um, I found that pretty overwhelming. And I figured out really fast because I was also having to write my own curriculum. Like we didn't really have any. Um, so I figured out really fast that I needed some kind of pattern, right? So. In English, I like went through all the standards and I figured out, you know, basically 50% of my class was going to be writing and 50% was going to be based around reading and vocabulary and that kind of thing. So I was like, well, we had four days of regular class and then our last, our Fridays were always shortened classes. So I basically decided that every Monday and Wednesday, we were going to work on a writing project, whatever it was. And every Tuesday, Thursday was going to be the reading stuff. And Friday was going to be our kind of fun English activity. So that really helped me because then I'm like, well, what are we going to be doing tomorrow? And it's like, well, we're working on writing. So whatever that means, whatever the next step is, I'm just like, oh, I can just do whatever's the next step for this writing project. Um, and that for me was really helpful. And actually my students really helped them get into the mindset of like, today's a writing day. Like we're thinking about writing. Um, and that obviously can translate to a lot of different things and a lot of different ways, especially in high school. Like you can figure out some patterns of what's in your content. Um, and how to divide up the days. And I know elementary school teachers a lot of times do this really well already. And actually I found as a high school teacher, I've been very inspired by what a lot of elementary school teachers do in that kind of pattern of like when to do things. And, and obviously also things aren't always in your realm of control, but what you can control, think about like, how can you just decide beforehand that always on a Monday, we're going to do writing. And for me, that was such a relief because I didn't have to be like, well, Oh, what am I going to do? And, and it just really helped that along really well. So that, yeah, I love that idea. And I, I, as you're talking, I said, yeah, I did something similar. Um, when I taught, um, sixth grade English, Friday was our writing day and we had a lot less writing cause it was just sixth grade, but yeah, that was always Friday was writing workshop days. And I think especially for subjects where you have a lot of different things that you have to cover a lot of that can be so helpful. And so, yeah, does that mean that you have no lesson planning? Of course not, but it gives you a place to start. So you're not staring at a blank screen, you know, every time that you get started. Yeah. I love that idea. Um, I think you had a few more. Oh, yeah. So and actually my Friday one, again, because we had a shortened class. So I sort of leveraged that to be something that was fun, but it wasn't necessary, but it was good for them. And so we would always do something called location writing, which we would go outside and write mm -hmm. and they would have to write about the same spot every day. And um, it was inspired by some other teachers, but they really liked that. And it was a really good way to also leverage the weird feeling of Friday. As most teachers know, Friday is always kind of funky. Uh, even if your schedule's not different. Uh, so that was really nice. And um, I always did. And these are like things just that most good teachers do anyway. But, you know, having a warm up. So I trained my kids because I'm also like introverted and I need like a moment between classes to transition. So I trained my students to come in and sit down and start writing every day for a warm up that I didn't have to tell them what to do. I They just came in and did it so that I could have a moment to get into the next class. Because especially when you teach high school and you're switching classes, there's just that transition can be very chaotic. Um, and so like we always knew that the first 10 minutes was going to be the writing warm up. And um, the hardest thing for me was actually ending class. And I, I struggled with that in college. And I, I still, ending class was hard for me. But my favorite thing that we did was I always ended my class with a quote. So I really love inspiring quotes and I collect them and I would just dismiss my class with a quote. Like, and it was really nice because it was just, they always knew that was the end. It was just always, I'm like, even if I don't have another good ending, at least they're getting some kind of wisdom <laughs> from somewhere about writing or about life. And it was just a way to kind of center ourselves at the end of class before they left. And we didn't have bells. So that was kind of like my bell, but just these rhythms of like, I always knew like, oh, I just got to pick a quote for today. I just had my little quote collection book next to me. And it's just like, you can just pick a random one and read it. And that, that was how we ended. And so I didn't have to decide like, what's the best way to end? Like, 
there was always at least one good thing to do, even if the rest of it kind of got off track. But so that was one of the other ways. Yeah, I love that, though, because then rather than thinking, how are we going to end? Am I going to do an exit ticket? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? Mm -hmm. It's just like, we always do this. (laughs) Or if you had two things that you really liked, you could alternate or whatever. You could do the same type of of theme thing. I thought that the high schoolers would not like it. It was really a risk for me to like try that because I'm like, oh, these high schoolers, they're not going to. They, it was one of their favorite things. They were like, Hello. where's the quote of the day? Like if I <laughs> if I forgot for some reason, they would be like, what the heck, Miss Smith? Like, what are you doing? We need our quote. And I'm like, okay, great. I'm so glad you like this. So that was incorrect. Even just like things that you don't think would work when you get into a rhythm, like kids really respond well to them. Even if they don't think on the front end that it's a good idea, they actually really respond well to rhythms, which I think we all know because of you know, routines are so important. And routines are another way, like those are ways that you're saving yourself from having to make decisions about what to do. So, yes, absolutely. So we've talked kind of a good amount about lesson planning and how we structure our class. And there's probably way more that we could talk about with that. But you're right, routines and other parts of our class can can be really helpful too. So one thing that I think, and we actually talk about this in Reclaim Your Time 101, is you can also create batches and rhythms to how you do your to-dos. Um, so for example, you could have a, uh, and you probably already do this to an extent, but you might ask yourself, well, what else could I add to it? You probably have some type of routine when you come into the classroom in the morning, right? You put, you know, you put your stuff away, you get out the homework, you know, whatever it is. Um, but you might ask yourself, well, what else can I tag in if it's something I have to do every day that I can just make part of my morning routine and I just always do it. And then you don't have to figure out when am I going to do this? Where am I? Where, you know, it's just, this is when I always do it and it's always done then. Um, Same thing. And this one you may or may not have is an end of day routine. Like after your last class, do you have a routine of like, I always do these three to four things before I leave? Um, Because if not, then you're spending time figuring out what should I do with this, you know, 30 minute block or 40 minutes or however long it is between when your class ends and when you have to leave. So you can also think of ways to, um, yeah, to have patterns of your own to do's. Yeah, I actually, it makes me think my one friend that I taught with, we actually kind of leveraged Friday afternoons because a lot of times teachers don't have to, they can leave when the kids leave, right? And we would actually go to a coffee shop and do a little bit more work to prep for the next week um, as a way to just like kind of eke in a little bit more of that time that, you know, isn't outside of our contract hours, but to use that and leverage it well so that we're prepared for the next week. And that was a really nice rhythm of like, we know we're going to go to the car and then we were drinking coffee. So it was fun, you know? So it, <laughs> it was, it wasn't like a sad work. It was, you know, we'd go drink coffee, do the rest of, do an hour of work and um, then we'd be prepared for the next week. So that actually we made decisions for the next week. Then even though we were a little tired, but we weren't as like stressed as a Sunday night or a Monday morning kind of thing. So. That Yeah, that's another rhythm that I, reminds me of like kind of leveraging that end time is really, really helpful. Yeah, I love that. That's such a great idea. Um, some other teachers have found it helpful to do themed days for their to-dos as well. Um, so I know some saying like, I'm going to make all my copies on Tuesdays or, you know, I'm going to do a big catch-up day on Thursday or like you said, you know, Friday, I'm going to go, you know, go sit here and finish up. And you probably had similar things you did every week, you know, that, that, mm-hmm. you, that you went through. Um, so Not all of these are going to work for everybody, but if one of these is intriguing, just try it out as an experiment, you know, for for a week or two and and see what you think. Um, Carly, any other ideas that come to mind as far as um, rhythms? Obviously, we could talk forever. There's so many different ideas um, before we get into, though. I think next we're going to talk about student rhythms. But did you have any final thoughts on kind of teacher and classroom rhythms? Yeah, nothing specific, but just thinking about like, what are the decisions that you get overwhelmed with, right? Like almost taking an inventory of like, what are Mm. the sticky moments of the day where you're like, I just don't know what to do and figure out backtrack. What other decisions are you making? What are you responsible for choosing? There's, and yeah, like the way that you relieve your decision fatigue is as unique as you are. So some decisions are harder for some people where that I would find really easy. And some things that I find easy are hard for others. Like, you know, it just goes both ways. And so I think just thinking about what are the decisions that feel most overwhelming and how can you go back and what are the ones that feel easy 
And how can you leverage the ones that feel easy? And how can you pre-make some of the ones that feel hard? Because you all, you have to have capacity to make decisions in the moment for students. So the more that you can pre-make decisions, that really helps kind of think through what are the actual strategies that are going to work for you. That's so smart, right? Identifying where actually is the problem so that you can troubleshoot it right there. I love that advice. This episode is brought to you in partnership with the Herzog Foundation. And one of the things the Herzog Foundation is seeking to do is to help create new Christian schools and homeschool co-ops. So if you have ever considered starting your own school or even just wish that that was a possibility, I encourage you to check out the resources available for free with Schoolbox. With Schoolbox, you can get free access to resources, courses, and if you're serious, even a mentor. So find out more and sign up at hfschoolbox.com. That's hfschoolbox.com. Now back to the conversation. All right. So we've talked about um, some ways that we can relieve decision f- fatigue and thinking about where where am I getting stuck? Um, what are some patterns that I can institute? We have just a few minutes left and I wanted to talk for a few minutes about student rhythms. Are there things that we can do to help our students make decisions and choose routines that help them? Because they are often dealing with, you know, kind of a, maybe not to the same extent as a teacher, but their their minds are, you know, they're, they're growing and they're dealing with the same same issues. Um, so Carly, I know you have a few ideas on this too. Yeah. And that's actually allowing, you know, student choice is like really big in, you know, the education sphere right now. And I think there's a lot of like good things and hard things about that, but involving students in deciding things actually can be helpful because in when you're not making a decision alone, it's not as difficult, right? Like there can be complications, but a lot of classes, I've seen some teachers do community contracts with their classes where they take time to set out like what, what is a good learning space for all of us look like and have the kids sort of almost instead of, you know, writing their rules and all that in the syllabus, they write their community agreements together at the beginning of the Mm -hmm. year. And because they do that, then throughout the year, as things come up that are complicated, they actually have class meetings where they revise those. Um, and so the the students are making decisions about what a good classroom looks like, and they're having to compromise with the needs of the teacher and the needs of other students. So that's like a way, and it takes time. So that can be, you know, a downside, but it is a having them help you make that decision can be really, really helpful for not feeling like you have to like figure all this stuff out on your own. Um, and especially with high schoolers, but I've seen people do it with elementary school. They ha- kind of have a more like uh, scaffolded framework for that, but um, that's one of them. And I mean, even just having students input into the rhythms. So when I did my warm ups, um, they actually asked if they could have an extra three minutes to talk because they're like, we talk too much. I had like one very chatty class and they they were like, we talk too much. And can we just like get all our chatter out after the writing warm up? And I was like, you know, that seems fair. If it means you're not going to talk more later, that'd be awesome. So we would set a timer for their writing warm up. And then after their writing warm up, they would just talk for three minutes and then we would do our class. And I was like, I can give you three minutes every day because you're full of energy and, you know, And so that was a compromise, but they, you know, they chose that rhythm and then that was my first 10 minutes and they decided that. Um, They also, I tried, I would try things sometimes and I would let them decide if it worked like, and, or help me figure out. And so we did this thing during COVID um, when I was teaching online, Uh, you know, it was a hard time, right? So we just wanted to do something fun on a Monday because Monday is just a hard day. So we did something called Monday Survey, and I literally just used this app called Mentimeter, where you could put three questions and people can participate. And they were super random questions because, you know, high schoolers like want to know weird things like what month of the year would you be if you were a month of the year or what's your favorite soda, whatever it is. And uh, I continued that because they were like, we want to do this every Monday. And we had just done it one Monday because I was like, let's do something fun. And they're like, can we do this every Monday? And I was like, you know. That is a pretty fun way to start the week. And they would ask questions. And sometimes I connected the questions to what we were going to talk about. And sometimes I didn't. But it was their input and like knowing that I'm not like this whole class isn't on my shoulders. But like these students actually have good ideas that I can leverage for what's best. And they can help 
me figure out what's best. And that actually, for me, even just relieved the pressure of like trying to figure out what to do, you know, because they're testing things, I'm testing things, and we're figuring things out together. That makes so much sense. Yeah, there, there's so much wisdom in, I don't know, it's funny, there's so much, like you said, talk about, you know, student choice and getting student buy in and all of that. And obviously, that is a wonderful benefit of, you know, getting students feedback, but that you're right, that also does relieve some of the burden on us to say, I, yes, I'm in charge of the class, I need, I, I make the ultimate decision. Um, but I don't have to come up with every idea. I can, I don't have to guess what the students like, I can ask them. <laughs> They can get their feedback and their input. That's so smart. Do you have any thoughts, Carly? I know sometimes when we think about, um, you know, getting students involved on like, when is a good thing to ask them and what's not a good thing to ask them? Do you have any thoughts on like how to, how to know where to share that and where not to? Yeah. And I think it depends on the teacher too. It, it, I guess for me, the line would be kind of like, where do I feel comfortable and that sometimes I had to stretch that a little bit, right? Like in a good way. And what is appropriate, it can also depend on your class. Because if your class takes it seriously, I had some classes that didn't take our community agreements like session seriously. I'm like, well, you guys aren't taking this seriously. So I'm going to decide what our rules are, right? And our agreements, and you're going to have to agree to them because you've forfeited the right because you aren't taking it seriously and you're not, you're not respecting one another. Um, and so, I don't, yeah, there's not a lot of solid, but you, and you can like do this slowly. Like I think definitely grew over time in what I was comfortable letting the students have input on. And some of it's like, well, you know, the standard says we have to write this kind of paper. So you, we have to write this kind of paper. Um, and I think I just tried to very clearly delineate what are the things that we have to do, non-negotiables. And then what are the things I'm willing to negotiate and inviting students into the negotiables, the things that are like secondary And that maybe don't matter as much or might be different for different classes and different for different students. Those that was kind of a helpful uh, way to divide it up of like, what are my non-negotiables and what are my negotiables? And allowing students into the negotiable area was a great opportunity. And it didn't mean that I had to do all of it. Sometimes I'm like, well, I want to do this. So (laughs) and I think it's good. So we're going to do it. But um, yeah, I think that is probably the, the framework that I use to kind of think about that. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I, and as you were saying that, I was thinking, yeah, and it's not like you're giving that up forever. If, if they make a decision and you're like, no, this isn't working. Like you're, there's still the teacher. You can always go back and say, Hey guys, we tried this and it's, it's just not working. We're going to go back to, back to whatever else. We're going to need to try something different. Um, but just that feedback when I think whenever you ask for feedback, it's always valuable. Like even if you don't end up making the change, you understand your class better and you have a better understanding of what interests them or what they would have picked. Um, whether you end up going with it or not. So I love, I love those ideas. Yeah. And they really, well, I wish we could talk. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> they really value honesty, right? Like they want to know that you're interested in them. And if you're honest about what is negotiable and what's not, they actually have a better understanding of how a class works, why you make decisions. And they respect that a lot. Well, thank you so much, Carly, for coming and talking about this. I wish we had time to talk longer, but I think we're about out of space. Uh, any final um, thought as we wrap up here? Yeah, I, you know, I was just thinking like rhythms and, and and relying on those like is such a biblical like idea, you know, and we haven't talked a lot about the connection to um, a Christ-centered life, but the Lord made us in days that repeat and have pattern to them. And so like, embracing that kind of rhythmic thing is just such a biblical way of living and and it's very freeing and very beautiful and like i think you know the idea of facing decision fatigue can be really like oh like how do i strategize but there's also just something like almost like a sigh of relief right of like oh this is a beautiful way to live and a beautiful way to teach um and so i even think like as you think about what strategies and like what's the beautiful way to have rhythms that celebrate the goodness of life and the goodness of the lord like i think that's something to keep kind of in the back of the mind i love that and it brings to mind too just also the need for sabbath rest right one of the mm-hmm. reasons that we need to take a day to rest is not just cuz our bodies need a break but our minds do <laughs> and our mm-hmm. minds need a break from thinking so much and making so many decisions and obviously we you know if you have a family or other responsibilities you not, can't like make zero decisions the whole day but definitely kind of decrease that number and give your mind a chance to rest and be ready for the new week 
Well, thank you again, Carly, so much for joining us. And I um, hope to have Carly back joining us many times here on the podcast in the coming months. Um, but thank you guys so much for being here to listen um, with us. All of the, uh, we're going to have the notes from this episode over at teachfortheheart.com slash 302, as well as some links to some of the resources that we mentioned. And before we go, we also want to let you know we have a free training um, coming up uh, very soon. It's called Classroom Management Answers, Simple Strategies to Reduce Disruptions and Rebuild Respect brand new free training. Uh, So check that out at teachfortheheart.com slash training. That's teachfortheheart.com slash training. Well, this episode was brought to you in partnership with the Herzog Foundation. Of course, all the views and opinions in this episode are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Herzog Foundation. Thank you so much for being here. We look forward to speaking with you again soon. In the meantime, teacher, remember God is at work in you and through you, and he's using you to make a difference. Keep your eyes on him and teach for the hearts.